and has a practical knowledge assessment, sorry, practice knowledge assessment, T5, Dr. Ken here with you, the T5 being topic five from a training package. So how does the video work? Simply, um, I pose a question or a problem to you pause and uh, the video and try and solve the problem. If you continue to play the video, I'll give you a hint. And again, you need to pause and then continue to the solution. Step four, I'll give you the answer. So the answer gets explained and this is the power of the system, of course, because not only do you get your answer confirmed, but you get explained why it's the correct answer. And then play the video again to proceed to the next question. So here's the first one. The EMF induced into itself as a result of a current flowing through a coil is called what? A, applied EMF, B, mutual induction, C, self-induced EMF, D, Fleming's law of EMF. So pause here. Here's the hint. Whose law of magnetism is actually at play here? Okay, the answer is self-induced EMF and it's Lenz's law, it's not Fleming's law. Fleming's law has to do with motors and generators, so this is Lenz's law, self-induced EMF. And it's Lenz's law because Lenz's law says that uh, any self-induced EMF is opposed or is in the opposite direction to the current that established that particular magnetic field and EMF. Two, select the appropriate category for the meter for the task listed. So if you are testing electric fry pan for its conductivity, maybe you are checking out um, the operation of a kilowatt hour meter. Three, testing a 24 volt power supply. Or finally four, a 15 amp vinyl sub circuit. I pause here. Here's the hint. Meter categories are about the power dissipated through the meter. A category one meter will handle a small amount of power dissipated through it. A category five can handle a lot of power being dissipated through it. So pause here again. And here's our answer. With an electric fry pan, you'd want to use a category two meter because you could have anything up to probably about 10 amps flowing through an electric fry pan. So you'd want to be able to withstand a couple of kilowatts of energy. A kilowatt hour meter, normally on a house, can normally handle about 63 amps. So 63 amps multiplied by 230 volts puts you up right up high. Category three, you'd have to be able to withstand a lot of power. 24 volt power supply, it's extra low voltage. So if it was 24 volts, it's say five or six amps, you certainly wouldn't get above a thousand watts, so low power. Finally, 15 amp final sub circuit, so 15 amps on a final sub circuit would uh, create three or four kilowatts. And again, you'd need a category four meter to be well protected from testing a final sub-circuit. Three, a moving coil ammeter has a full-scale deflection, that's FSD, of five milliamps and an internal resistance of 40 ohms. Determine the shunt to give the ammeter a range of 15 amps. So pause here. Here's the hint, draw the circuit and use Ohm's law around the circuit. So draw the circuit, with the information that you've got. So here's the answer. The voltage across the meter is going to equal the resistance of the meter, multiply the current through the meter. So we know we're going to have 
our 40 ohms multiplied by our 5 milliamps means we're going to get about 0.2 of a volt dropped across the meter. Therefore, let's apply that to Ohm's law that says our RS, our resistance shunt, the S stands for shunt, will be volts across the meter. That we just worked out at 0.2. The, camp, the amps through the shunt, which we know is to be 15 amps. Well, it's actually 15 amps minus 5 milliamps, but the 5 milliamps is so small it won't make a great deal of difference. So 0.2 divided by 15 amps means our resistor shunt will be 13.3. So again, as I suggested, um, drawing the meter, it's a, it's a moving coil meter. And we want to put a shunt resistor across it. And so the first thing we did is we worked out the voltage drop across the meter to cause full scale deflection, which was that. We then that used that voltage across our resistor because we know that we want to be able to put 15 amps in here and we know that we wanted 15 amps to be able to go down there yes there's a tiny bit through here but it's so small we could ignore it we wanted this to have 15 amps going through it and we know that we did not want to create any more than 10 volt drop sorry 0.2 volt drop across it so therefore we just used Ohm's law 0.2 of a volt divided by 15 gave us a 13.3 milli ohm resistor. So a very, very small resistor in, um, in resistance size, but it would probably need to be a 10 or 15 watt in power perspective. Four of the devices listed, which will switch high currents? A, a reed switch, B, a control relay, C, a hall effect switch, or D, a contactor. Here's the hint. Think about how much each operates and their use. So how does each one operate and what's their use? Give you some idea of their current usage. So the correct answer is a contactor. Reed switch will only carry a few milliamps. Control relay may carry up to maybe 8 or 10. Hall effect switch, again, will only carry a few milliamps. And a contactor, you can get them quite large. They can carry anything from 10 or 15 amps up to hundreds of amps. Five, the property of magnetization is only found in which material? So the property of magnetization is only found in A, ferromagnetic materials, B, paramagnetic materials, C, diamagnetic materials, and C, paramagnetic materials. Here's your hint. List the characteristics of all these magnetic material types. So the only one that has a property of magnetization, which means it stays permanently magnetized, is anything that is a ferromagnetic material. It needs to have some ferro or some iron in it to have that particular property. Six DC contactors often use what is, is used to extinguish the opening or the switching arcs. So DC contactors, tend to draw quite a significant arc, particularly when they open. So how do we go about dis extinguishing or putting out those switching arcs? A, a Jacob's ladder. B, an oil dash pot. C, blowout coils. D, a Wheatstone bridge.
Here's your hint. DC arcs are extinguished by stretching the arc out. So how can we go about stretching the arc out with one of these devices? So the answer is a blowout coils. What that does is it puts a magnetic field in the way of the arc. The arc has its own magnetic field that interacts with the magnetic field of the blowout coil and causes the arc to be extended. And when the arc gets extended, it gets extinguished. Seven, select the appropriate application for the devices listed. So we've got Hall Effects sensor. If you're gonna use it on a touch panel, limit switch, temperature sensor. B, contactors, voltage protection, motor starter, overload protection. C, a clamp meter, current protection, current measurement, voltage measurement. D, moving coil meter, touch screen, volt meter, overload protection. So pause here. So the hint is, how does each device work? So think about how each device works. And here are our answer, Hall Effect Sensor. It's used as part of a limit switch system. Contactor is part of normally a motor starter. Clamp meter is used to measure current. And moving coil meter is most often used as a volt meter. Eight. Hall effect is a charge build-up across a conductor because electrons are moved to one side by. So what, how, what moves the electrons to one side by? A. The permeability of the material. B. The spinning of the conductor. C. A voltage. Or D. A magnetic field. Here's your hint, draw the circuit for a Hall effect switch. How does a Hall effect switch work? So the answer is a magnetic field. So we can detect that the electrons have all been moved to one side of a semiconductor in actual fact, and it uses a magnetic field if So that brings us to the end of T5. Thanks for listening again. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about electromagnetism.